Hello, welcome to Exotic Gardening UK, your Chris Weekly. And on this week's episode, we'll be looking at a Mediterranean garden in Barnsley, a celebrated 20th century garden in Leeds, and a tropical garden in Louth. Wow, I can't believe how warm it is today. We're in late October now, and the weather has been amazingly mild all month. Yes, we've had the odd dip down to about five degrees, but on the whole, we've had pretty mild nights and the days have been really good as well. It's currently 17 degrees in my garden, so it's actually probably a bit too warm for this top, but it's absolutely glorious. And the garden's still looking good, but there's lots of jobs to do this week to start thinking about really getting things away for winter, because although it's mild right now, it won't be long before those frosts arrive. Last month, I visited a truly wonderful garden in Leeds, Yorkgate Garden, which is open to the public. It's not just an exotic garden, it's got lots of different types of garden rooms within the one acre site and the area we really want to look at in this video is the exotic garden which has been created over the last three years by the new head gardener Jack Ogg. So let's have a look at that now. Hello uh, my name is Jack Ogg and I am the head gardener here at Yorkgate Garden. Yorkgate Garden, owned by Perennial, the UK's only charity dedicated to helping everyone who works in horticulture and their families that's anyone working with plants, trees, flowers or grass. If they have a problem, however large or small, they can pick up the phone to Perennial and know they will receive the help they need. So although Yorkgate has many exotic and interesting plants dotted throughout the many different smaller gardens within the whole garden, it's really the exotic garden that I want to have a good look around. So let's have a tour around this very special area. So one of my personal favourite combinations that I've done in Sybil's tropical garden here is, is this rainbow chard, which is a standard garden vegetable, and, uh, and this Pelia insolens, insolens um, which is a, a new one for me. It's in the urticaceae, so the nettle family, and I, I love that leaf. It's a, it's a gorgeous leaf, and then a really dark, sort of purpley red petiole and stem on the plant. It does flower, makes a little kind of white, nettly looking racemey type flower not most not the most interesting thing but that leaf is is absolutely fantastic and then above it uh, I have a plant that people keep complaining at me about thinking it's Himalayan balsam but it's uh, Impatiens balfourii and then above that one there is Salvia confertiflora with uh, tiny tiny little red flowers in really tall spikes but a wonderful plant Bit of an unpleasant smelling leaf but for that flower structure and for that big shrubby meaty salvia plant it's it's well worth growing this is another um lovely impatiens species that we've got here this is impatiens sodenii it's quite often you see the pink form available but this is this is obviously the, the white form and it's got that lovely kind of pinky purpley marking to the to the center of each petal it's a nice little plant. Not hardy, uh, I have to lift it and, and store it for winter, but incredibly easy from cuttings. Just cut them off, stick them in a glass of water and they root. I grow a few different kinds of begonias in the garden, but one of my favorites is this uh, begonia pedatifida, um, and it's completely hardy. I, the first couple of years I grew it, I mulched it and piled, piled leaf mold over the top of it, and and panicked about it and it and it's been absolutely hardy the past couple of years i haven't bothered even protecting it in any way and it seems to be seems to be quite happy as just a garden perennial it does have uh, a very nice small white flower but it's held underneath the foliage so you don't see it but for that leaf alone i would highly recommend growing it this is another one of my favorite combinations here i've got sorumatum venosum the the voodoo lily and then in front of it I have this Colocasia galliangonensis, or however you pronounce the name of this plant, and it's it's proved completely hardy for me. It runs runs about with stolons, and then quite excitingly, the first time for me, it's producing a big flower, the standard sort of aroid flower with the the spathe and spadix, but this time around, it's got a 
a yellow spathe and I believe a yellow spadix, but it's not opened yet, so I don't know. But I like that combination. Another begonia that we grow here is this tender begonia. It's begonia fuchsioides. So fuchsioides, oides means like, so it's fuchsia-like flowers on a begonia. And it, it confuses people really, because it, it does look a lot like a fuchsia, but it's a begonia. Very nice, very easy from cutting again. Um, I root it in water and plant them out. So we're lucky enough to have seven full-size tree ferns in Sybil's garden. And I like a tree fern as much as the next person does, as much as the next tropical plant grower does. But they're a big column of brown with fronds on the top. So I've decorated them, uh, added to them with different epiphytes. So we've got about four or five different types of Tillandsia, Tillandsia bergeri and uh, the Spanish moss, the standard Spanish moss that is Usneoides. Uh, and then also I uh, had a bit of an experiment. I took some cuttings of this Impatiens Arguta Blue Dream, um, rooted them in water and stuffed the rooted cuttings into the, into the fibrous trunk of the tree fern and they've grown away quite happily, growing as epiphytes and clinging onto the, onto the trunk of the tree fern. We protect our tree ferns. I, I wrap them with fleece and then one of our volunteers has very kindly made me some winter jackets, a bit like a, like a duffel coat, but they're made out of uh, old Hessian coffee bags. So they've still got the Colombian writing on and the pictures of the coffee on the front and they do up with little wooden toggles around the front of them. So they're, they're an attractive thing in their own right. Uh, all of the tree ferns in Sybil's garden, I have a drip feed running up the back of them. So I've hidden it up the back of the trunk, hopefully so you can't see it and all the tree ferns, but that just drips in and I set that going every couple of days or so to just have a constant drip for a number of hours at a time. So now let's enter the exotic garden here at York Hay Garden. And as we can see, We've got some familiar plants, including the onset bananas up there. We've got lots of interesting flowering annual and returning perennial plants, including lots of empatience. We've got the annual nasturtiums to add a bit of late summer colour because we're well into September now. We've got some selaniums there, pyracantha, euphorbias, eucomis. And these eucomis, although they're finished flowering, is by colour, still got architectural form with these seed pods forming so still really interesting to have in the garden and then there's the flowering eucomis of polyvencii and sparkling burgundy around here here we have a plant related to himalayan balsam but it's not this is a different form and it's much more daintier but it does have those explosive seed pods that will spread about bees love this as well We've got a nice ginger here, we've got greeny eye. And a vegetable in the exotic garden, but it does add some interest. We've got this Swiss chard with the red midrib. Looks as exotic as an aroid to me, so it does fit in with this style of planting. And up here we have a wonderful salvia with its rusty red flower heads, adding a good strong splash of colour this late in the season. Around here, we have this wonderful, wonderful returning sort of shrub. It's a half hardy to hardy shrub with its wonderful architectural leaves. It will grow yellow daisy-like flowers, but it's the leaves that it's grown for. And they're nice and large, as you can see, compared to my hand. So this is a plain green form. But if we move around, we can see that there's a purple form as well. So it's a bit smaller leaves, but if we look under the, the leaves, you can see it's a nice, strong purple colour. Wonderful plant. The purple one's tender compared to the straight green form, but it's still excellent to have in the garden. It's well worth growing and planting out. Got a nice Sheffella here, umbrella tree, with a new flush of growth coming up there and this will grow very tall in this part of the garden if i just pan out you can see we've got a yew hedge 
surrounding the garden so it gives it lots of protection ideal for these tender and exotic plants more salvias here wonderful purple color pinky purple we've got the canna musifolias down here and other cannas surrounding this part of the garden and what's a bit different from a lot of exotic gardens is the use of these empathians and these annuals to add lots of sort of delicate colour in between the big robust plants like the musabaju and the bamboos and the cannas. Got a nice seat in here area here. Red dragon adding some height to this part of the garden. And some more mooses, nice bananas in the background there. And grasses also for that architectural look at the back of the border. We'll just pan around. Got delicate Fagicia bamboos in this area that won't overtake and you know drown out the plants compared to the phyllostachys that will run everywhere. And we'll just look back there. So this part of the garden, this exotic garden, is a circular area. So we'll carry on clockwise around. We've got to a cool lush corner now as we go past this bamboo and we've got this nice ginger, this Hedicium forestii, looking very lush after a recent rainstorm. We've got the Fatsia polycarpa and the tree ferns here, got Dixonia antarctica. And some more lush foliage in this nice green relaxing part of the exotic garden. More tree ferns as we go around and Sheffalas here, beautiful architectural plants and nice Japanese grasses that enjoy the shade and the lushness in this part of the exotic garden. And these are beautiful when the wind goes through them. It looks a bit like the ripples on the sea. And a bit of colour climbing up here. So we've got nasturtiums being trained up. A Sheffala, this large umbrella tree that's very high up now. Some Spanish moss up there as well. And we've even got over here on this old stump of a tree fern, we've got some pitcher plants that are growing outside for the summer. So these were brought in for winter, but I'll just zoom in and you can see those wonderful pictures on this tropical Nepenthes. As we complete our circular tour, we can see more tree ferns with bromeliads growing on the trunks of those. and many more tree ferns in this part of the garden, on both sides of the path. Very long, luscious fronds here as well, so these are obviously well tended and well watered. And I've just noticed on this Scheffler, we've actually got a flower spray as well, so fingers crossed, we might get some berries later on in the season. More fatsias down there, persicaria, Hostas by the path as well. And we'll go past the tree ferns and we'll just finish our loop around this quite magical exotic garden here at Yorkgate Gardens. I hope you enjoyed that look around Sybil's garden at Yorkgate Garden. We'll be back later on in a new episode where we have a full look around Yorgate Garden, not, not just at the exotic garden, but the dry garden and all the other areas as well and how it's developed over the years. So I'm standing here next to my, well, one of my favorite palms. This is Briar Amata. And as you know, I'm a pretty tall guy. I'm nearly two meters tall, six foot four and a bit. And this palm now is tall as me and it's grown this large over the last of 10, 12 years since I bought it. I had it in a small pot to begin with, then a larger pot 
and then about six seven years ago we planted it in the ground and lots of people do ask how do you protect these palms well in the case of this primata now it's got to this size with this much trunk I don't protect this at all so it just gets through winters it'll have lots of cold nights on cold winters it'll get snow it'll get ice it gets the winds as well and now it's this size it's sort of too hard to put a big shelter over the top of this area but i do have to be careful about the crown so if it got to be really cold so if we're looking at below minus six degrees what i would do is just wrap fleece around the spears in the center if snow is going to come with those cold temperatures and as soon as a chance of snow has passed i'll remove that fleece and we're talking days here we're not talking weeks or months leaving fleece on it because they really do not like the humidity and basically having that close contact with the fleece on the newly emerging leaves you just want that there just as short a time as possible just to stop snow getting into the crown getting into the center and then ice forming and sort of potentially rotting the center and getting spear pull which can happen but when this was much smaller i did put a shelter over it and depending where you live you might not need to give this any protection whatsoever in my location it's borderline it's fine for the last few winters if this was out in a 2010 winter where we got down to minus 10 this would have probably died or looked extremely bad if it did survive thankfully back in 2010 this was in a pot and it was in the garage over that winter and it survived fine so that's a bryomata stunning stunning palm you can see it in the sunlight now with the beautiful blue leaves one i wouldn't move out in the garden because it's so different from most of the other palms now it's time to look around another garden and this time we're going down south just a little bit down to lincolnshire to louth to see the secret garden of louth so today i'm in the secret garden of louth which is in lincolnshire so on the east side of the uk and this is roger and jenny's garden that they've created over the last sort of quarter of a century and it's been open for the National Garden Scheme for the last 20 years. So you can actually come and visit this garden in the summer months. And we're gonna have a good look around this garden, see some of the highlights, some of the interesting plants. So this is one of my favorite areas of the garden. It's a koi pond. It's a large dominant feature in this part of the garden. It's been softened by ivy going around the side. And obviously your eyes are drawn to the luxuriant exotic planting on all sides as well as the fish in the center and as we come down this way we go underneath an archway as you walk under this archway we've got absolutely loads of exotic plants again all the way through and your view is taken to the left and also to the right as we go around this large circular bed So in another area of the garden, I'm surrounded by luscious leaves and very colourful flowers, including this wonderful Cleome with its pink, bright pink flowers in this case, rather than usual purple. We've got more dailies surrounding us. We've got the Brugmansias in bloom. We've got Xantidesia leaves here. We've got the palm trees, bananas, melianthus, ricinus, more abutions behind as well all enveloped in this area and if you've ever visited my garden or obviously seen my garden walkthroughs this garden is like that but on steroids it is so much better than my garden because it's got a lot of the similar sort of plants but on a much bigger scale the garden itself here is about 80 85 meters in length and it looks to be about 10 meters wide so it's a long narrow garden but the amount of paths that go around this garden, little secret areas, got masses of seating areas to rest and uh, admire the view as well. It all creates this sort of quite disorientating in terms of not knowing what's around the corner and how wide, how long the garden is feel. But it really adds up to a really magical feel as you walk around the garden. 
look at the size of this Dixonia Antarctica tree fern. And it's not just one tree fern, it's in fact two that have grown together, or it's been one and then it's divided into two heads at the top. And the girth on this is huge. This is an absolutely magnificent specimen. So you often see these as quite small plants or quite thin trunked ones, but this honestly is a good about 30, 40 centimeters across and wide. And as you know, I'm pretty tall. So this trunk is well over six foot tall and the fronds are about six foot long as well. So a huge specimen. And this is one of, sort of the shadier spots in the garden, but there's loads of pockets of color everywhere as we look around. So I'll show you those now. So just here, as we walk down this path, on one side, we've got these abutions and the variegated forms here with the wonderful tangerine apricot colored flowers. We've got dahlias down here as well. And to my left, we've got the ginger that I grow a lot of, and that is Hedicium forestii with these really intricate blooms that do have a slight scent, but it's mainly for the actual blooms, how they look and the very luscious foliage as well. Very hardy ginger and it looks beautiful in this setting. So I'm in one of the many seating areas in this garden and it is great to have so many options to sit and enjoy and admire the view from all different angles. So the view I've got now is of the wonderful onset bananas and we've got the summer colour, not just from the flowers, but also of the foliage of things like the irisene and the solenstomum and begonias as well. And wherever you are in the garden, there's so many plants to see. We've got the large ones that do the backbone work, but then we've got so many small, intricate little plants just hidden away in nooks and crannies. Wherever you look, you'll see colour, form and interest. And I think both Roger and, and Jenny have done a tremendous job in creating this garden over the last quarter of a century, taking a you know, generic suburban, big long lawn with some fruit trees and creating this truly tropical paradise in uh, Lincolnshire in the UK. I'm taking away lots of ideas from this garden that I'll incorporate into mine. This is, like I said earlier, there's many plants that I do grow in my garden, in this garden, but there's a lot more as well and there's a lot more scale and how they've been planted out. So there's lots of ideas that I'll be able to uh, incorporate into my garden in future years. And I would say if you're ever in the area in the summer months, I would definitely book in and view this garden for inspiration and just the true wow factor of how an exotic tropical garden can look in the UK. So is this a very high maintenance garden? Well, it certainly is the amount of work that goes into preparing the garden for spring and all the work that goes into bringing things in that are tender for winter and propagating. Is it worth it? I think the pictures speak for themselves. That was a secret garden of Lauf. What a garden it is. And we'll be back later in a different episode where we have a full, slow tour around the garden so we can see all the different areas and how they all work together. So check out that video in a few weeks' time. And one of the key things about the secret garden of Lauf is the use of colour, including lots of annuals. And now we get into the end of October, it's definitely the time to be collecting seeds from annuals for next year's display. So behind me, the bees buzzing about, we've got the Tifonia or the Mexican sunflower. These have grown crazily tall in my garden this year. These are over two and a half meters tall. I've got one just behind the ca uh, camera that's over three meters tall now, which is double the height they normally should get to. So they've grown exceptionally well in this hot summer with this rich soil in this part of the garden. But back to saving the seeds. So normally sort of reaching down here, I'm having to reach high up to get the seeds. And you want to do this really before it gets really wet because the seeds will rot off from the seed pods. But you just get the seed head just like that, picking it off. And then the seeds are actually all encased in the bottom of these little individual little pouches basically. And you can just dry that somewhere warm and dry for a few days to really dry it out to make sure there's no mold. And then get out the seeds from the individual pouches and then you can keep that in a 
paper bag, a brown paper envelope, something like that, somewhere cool over winter before sowing the seeds for next year's summer display in April. So this is my newer dry exotic border that I actually planted up this year for the first time. This was originally mainly colocasias and dahlias, but that all got dug up this spring and I planted out lots of aeoniums and agaves, with the idea being the agaves, although small now, will hopefully establish over the next few years and dominate this bed when they get nice and large. And the aeoniums will be dug up very soon and then brought back out next year to fill in the spaces until the agaves get bigger and bigger. And it's been a success, I think, for the first year. I've not had to water this bed at all. and Plants have still got on with it, even in this extreme hot, dry summer that we had in 2022. So I lift my aeoniums and I'll keep the agaves in the ground with some protection because they're not the hardiest types. And we're going to go to another garden on a similar sort of theme of dry Mediterranean style plants created or made by Richard Darlow in Barnsley. Hello, I'm Richard Darlow and uh, I'm here to talk about my Mediterranean garden. Uh, we're in Barnsley in South Yorkshire. Um, the garden was created in 1990 and I actually bought the house specifically with the intention of creating a Mediterranean garden. Um, so the, the proviso was that it was a south facing plot and therefore receiving full sun and being of a reasonable size for a town garden. So the garden was, uh, the site was cleared initially and the garden was then planted up in 1990. So in the time frame since then, it's changed dramatically. Uh, the garden has evolved. Um, I created an, init an initial outline plan of the layout, um, but the planting uh, has changed pretty much in every respect since then. Uh, there are perhaps a handful of plants that were planted right at the very beginning that are still here now, but many plants um, they've either been replaced with something more exotic or in some cases they have died through winter weather or whatever. Um, but the intention was to create an authentic Mediterranean garden. So in other words, every plant in it is the kind of plant that you would see growing in gardens around the Mediterranean. Obviously, the hardiest types of plants that we can get away with in the UK. Uh, there's been quite a lot of surprises having said that things have grown and thrived that I didn't expect to and conversely some things haven't grown and thrived that I did expect would do. So it's been a mixed bag um, and uh, the, the latest few years I've now devoted more to growing a wider range of cacti and succulents such as agaves uh, and the puntias and other cacti um, and I'm finding through experiment uh, the best way of doing that is to grow them in pure gravel and that way you're assisting the passage of water from the roots as quickly as possible particularly in the winter weather and up to now it's proved quite successful. There's been one or two that have still turned their toes up a little bit at it but by and large they've survived and, and are doing well. Um, some of the cacti don't particularly grow because being in gravel and nothing else they're not getting any nutrients uh, but nevertheless they are looking healthy and are surviving the winter weather. So it's an ongoing uh, job 
uh, the garden is never finished. So it's changing all the time, experimenting all the time, pushing the boundaries all the time. Um, and one of the advantages of climate change might be that we can grow things that we previously couldn't. But that said, I always find even though things are getting warmer, every now and then we still get a vicious winter that sees things off. So this is the main arid bed here with the agaves planted out, We've got the Apuntia cacti as well. And these huge specimens, we've got a Montana and we've also got the Wales Ton agave here of Atifolia. And we've got another form just around the corner. And this bed benefits from full sun, it's south facing and it's just a full gravel bed built with rockery stone as well. And these plants really appreciate the elevation, the drainage and the heat in this part of the garden. But the full garden is south facing, so everything in this Mediterranean style garden benefits from lots of sun from the start of the day to the end of the day with very little shade as the sun passes through from east to west. And we've got so many different exotic but more Mediterranean arid style planting here in this garden. So we've got the typical plants you'd find in a Mediterranean garden which include the lavenders, we've got olives, we've got yuccas, we've got the chemorops, camerops farms as well. And then we've got lots of different yuccas and agaves and cacti mixed in as well. We've got some nice passion flowers by the house. We've got the almond tree in the corner. We've got some nice magnolias and we've got some other tropical plants that you expect in a more tropical jungle style garden, including a ginger and a tetrapanax as well. But overall, what Richard's done here is produce a Mediterranean style garden here in north of England in Barnsley. So here's something you don't see every day. We've got an almond tree behind us. Not only has it flowered earlier in the year, it's actually bearing fruit and we'll have some almonds forming all over this tree. Uh, in the garden there are currently four Trachycarpus, uh, three Fortunis and one Waggy. The largest uh, is now around 15 feet plus in height. Uh, it was planted in 1990 so it's one of the original plantings but it was purchased in 1985 and where I lived at the time I, I hadn't got a garden so it stayed it was a very small plant stayed in a pot on the windowsill inside the house and for four years or so it grew indoors and then in 1990 it was planted out still as a very small plant as I say it's now uh, getting towards uh, heading towards 20 feet in height. Look at this this is Pseudo Panax ferox it's a plant I grow in my garden as well but it's nowhere near as mature as this specimen it's got a nice clean clear trunk now and it's lost all the juvenile leaves, which mine still has, which are the ones that face downwards. And this has a nice shorter canopy of more mature leaves and lots of flower buds ready to open up over the next few weeks. So this is a huge specimen. It shows how hardy it is, because it's obviously got through many, many winters up here in Barnsley in Yorkshire. And it's obviously got through all those cold temperatures and snow. It's not buckled under any wind or snow and it's uh, thriving in this location very open in all directions got a good sturdy trunk that i can't quite get my hand around it's got a good diameter on this trunk pretty straight it's branched up at the top and like i said it's getting ready to flower so what rich has done is rather special i think he's picked a theme in this case a mediterranean style garden rather than the usual sort of jungle and tropical style exotic garden and he's really run with that theme and picked all the plants that like that hot climate, like the dry conditions, which is something quite different really from the actual climate that it's actually uh, growing in, in Barnsley in South Yorkshire. And the main sort of standout plants in the garden are the yuccas and the agaves. And he's let things get on and grow 
without any winter protection. So all the plants you see in this film, this footage, they've been planted out without any protection. Obviously some of the tender plants in pots are brought inside, but the ones in the ground have gone through many winters without any protection whatsoever. So the drainage is vital. The south facing aspect is also really important to allow these plants to survive the winters because they like the dry conditions and the actual choice of species and forms of these plants that are more suitable to the wet, cold winters that you get in the UK. So I think it's a real credit to Richard how he's put these plants together to create this garden and it's something quite unexpected as I said to find here in Yorkshire. I've got to say Richard's garden was a bit of a surprise to me. I wasn't expecting to see so many arid style plants in a Mediterranean garden just a few miles away from where I live here in Yorkshire but it does go to show if you try lots of these plants try different forms and try hardier forms of plants that look very exotic then you can get lucky and you can find the ones that do thrive in your location it's always worth trying different ones Richard has gone through many years of trying different apuntias different cacti and yuccas and found the ones that work for him and grow well in his South Yorkshire garden and you may have seen in that video, he was actually taking some of the seeds of his Trachycarpus fortunii or fortuni that he had grown since 1985 and it now seeds every year, being a female plant. And I've luckily got some of those seeds here. And they're very easy to grow from seed. You don't need to give them much special care or attention. So I'm not going to give you a master class in how to germinate Trachycarpus seeds, but I'll just quickly go through the process of what's worked for me. So these seeds here were produced from the flowers and fruits of last year. They matured all last summer and winter and held on to the plant until this year. And then they've been cut down now. So they've taken about a, about a year to mature. And you've got these black glossy seeds, which are basically fruits with the seeds inside. And the quick way to do it without too much hassle is to basically just shake off these seeds get a big tub and I like to use a washing up bowl that I've put some holes in the bottom and then fill that with some gritty compost so, uh, some soil based compost is good as well so like John Inns compost but make sure you add some grit or perlite just to break it up so it's not too heavy and then lay a load of seeds on top of that compost and then do another centimetre or two of the compost on top put that somewhere anywhere sort of outside and you might not see seeds germinate for a while, but come next spring, they will germinate and then you'll get lots and lots of seeds germinating very quickly once they first start germinating. And then they can be easily transplanted into their own pots after just a few weeks once you've got that first leaf or two forming. Now, the better way of doing it, if you want quicker germination, is to actually get these fruits and get rid of all the, the pulp wash the seeds and put them into individual pots. But I found just by doing the washing up method of putting lots of seeds in one container, being patient and waiting basically for the winter and then the next spring and you'll see them germination pretty quickly thereafter. So now it's time to go back to the secret garden of Lauf and actually hear from the gardeners themselves. So we're gonna hear from Jenny talking about how she created the garden throughout the last 25 years, how it's developed, and we're gonna show you some of the wonderful highlights of that garden now. I'm Jenny Grasham. My husband and I, husband's Roger, we've, uh, we, we own the secret garden of Louth. I first sunk a spade out here when God, Roger wasn't interested about 30 years ago, when it was all grass and a few fruit trees, and in a nutshell, I just kept on digging. And the original planting was probably, if I say common plants, plants that most people have in their gardens. Um, it was that way for many years. And uh, it was probably, ooh, I mean, we've been opening the garden for 20 years. And I think it was, I know it was 2011 when I decided I wanted more of these exotic plants around in the garden. 
And so that's when I started to push the boat out and um, every holiday has been a busman's holiday, seeking out plants and looking at other gardens. And we thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed the years of doing that. And that's gradually built up to what we've got now is this um, quite mature looking garden now. We're full of um, lots of exotic plants, picking out these last few years more of the sought after, a little bit rarer things to come by. Um, got, got a few of those now. And um, in amongst it all are some regular hardy plants that seem to sit very comfortably alongside them. So if ever there was a horrible 2010 winter again, um, we'd still be left with a garden, even if some of our exotics were lost. Although hopefully most would be fine because um, we haul that many plants into the house. It's, you know, soon we'll have to move out and live in a tent. But I'm very good at packing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's what we've got now and uh, we'll keep doing it for as long as we can keep on doing it. We opened originally uh, for the NGS, National Garden Scheme, in 2003, I think it was. And uh, yeah, it was, the layout was the same as it is now, except for where there was my natural pond, it sprung a leak two or three years ago, couldn't fix it, I said time for change, and it's now a, place I really enjoy in the middle of the garden, it's a sunken seating area. So yes, originally it was fairly traditional looking garden plant-wise, but the layout was as it is now and I knew I always liked um, generous borders, generous planting, lush foliage, um, and I'm, I'm achieving that more now with these plants, but of course in those days I didn't know about the existence of a lot of these plants, so it was fairly standard sort of planting um, and it went down very well for a lot of years. I'm often asked what um, inspired me to suddenly change my planting. Well, I think it was already there in me that I liked big leaves and I, I actually had one banana plant in the garden originally. Um, it did flower one year and all. Um, and like I say, I, until I actually um, caught up with the rest of the world, or at least the younger ones, and, and got a smartphone, um, I didn't know anything about a lot of these plants. And because I got a smartphone and we visited Will Giles' garden, and I always loved that, um, and I came home from there one visit and said to our son, do you know what? I said, he's got a Facebook page for his garden. I said, can I have one of those? And Gareth said, sure you can and he set that up for me. Um, I've never wanted to have a personal Facebook friend page with all the friends and this, that and the other, but what I did find on there when I started looking, um, there was all these gardening groups, exotic gardening groups, hardy tropicals and, and oh, all manner of groups that um, encompassed all these plants really. And uh, so that's really, from there, I thought, wow, you know, now I can do this, now I can do that. And I found out of the existence of many of the plants and also where to find them, because you don't find these sort of plants um, in a, just a regular garden centre. They have improved in recent years with a few bits, you know, but um, yeah, you, you have to work a little bit harder to find a lot of these plants. We've always liked going away in our caravan, our little old box on wheels out there. <clears throat> and um, yeah, we would tend to head for further south because we're in Louth in Lincolnshire, the secret garden of Louth, not Louth in Ireland. <laughs> um, and yes, in this area, there's, there's very little to cater for exotic planting. Um, one or two are popping up now in, in the county. But um, we used to go down to, to say, Battle near Hastings and park up there and we, we used to ride out for days finding all these little nurseries and places and Googling to see what was where. And then we go another time, we've gone to Cornwall a few years, where down, you know, if you basically head south or southwest and you'll find a lot more 
availability on exotic plants and also on the Facebook um, you get to read lots of other people's uh, experiences with online shopping so you can pick and choose who's good to go for. Uh, a favourite plant for me is extremely tricky, it might even depend what mood I'm in. Um, but I, 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 all I can say is at this, at this present time, now that we've progressed this far, um, maybe I'm getting more into the Aurelia family. And I mean, I've moved on a little bit more past the Fatsia japonica, you know, which is a fantastic plant to have. I've got more than one of them and, and variegated ones. I've got all those, you know. Um, but things like the Brassiopsis family and I have one plant that I worked extremely hard to get, um, communicating with uh, people at Great Dixter. And when I knew that a guy called Dino Pelizzaro was one of the nurseries that came over from France each year to their nursery. And I'd seen in the garden at Dixter this plant and it, the gardener told me it was Oreopanax dactylifolius and I just fell in love with it when I saw it and I thought I've got to have that. He told me about the guy coming, hence we had a weekend down there and after various email in phone calls making arrangements to be totally sure that I was going to get one, that it will bring one for me, he did and I think I spent most of the plant fair time round his stall because he came over from France with such amazing plants. So my, I think the plant I, that I'm most attached to and would be most upset to lose would be my Oreopanax dactylifolius because it would be nigh on impossible to source another one now. That's probably why it's a favourite. Well, to start the year, it's, it's for the point, from the point of view of, of bringing everything out of storage, if you like, um, there's quite a process involved because uh, some stuff has to be held back longer than others. Um, we actually purchased a couple of um, temporary greenhouse things this year so that we could kick things out with still a bit of protection um, so that I could work in the space left inside and set seeds going and um, other things that needed to be under glass down at the other greenhouses because we've got a big conservatory that's used as a greenhouse in the winter. Um, so there's quite a process that has to be worked through and takes oh, a couple of months probably easily of us gradually getting things to the outside. Um, then when the weather's right, usually by the end of May, everything will be outside and uh, just stood around in various places. And then for end of May, early June, we seriously start planting out and there's some very huge bananas and sets and all sorts that, uh, just so many plants, <laughs> um, get trawled down from, we've got 20 brook manxias upstairs in a spare bedroom, which we bring down and they'll go outside and start to leaf up again. And they've all got to be planted out around the garden. Um, and then you've got the reverse process at the end of the year, which is perhaps a little bit more dicey at times because you've just got to always have your nose on the weather forecast, keep watching that and we'll have to sort of look at things and think, well, what's the most vulnerable, what's the most tender? Maybe some of the first that come in are the, um, oh, the succulents when you know because they if it's turning a bit cold and it's gone a bit wet they really hate it so they'll get shoved inside quickly first of all perhaps um, and then you just keep watching the temperatures the night temperatures and see how things are going and we'll often start the process of digging things up like the, the bigger stuff getting it out of the garden into their pots for winter storage but they'll stand outside somewhere cluttering the place up, you know, um, so that we can actually keep them out of doors for as long as possible, which is more favourable for us and the plants. And then they're ready to bring in at reasonably short notice. There's too much to be able to do, just nip out one afternoon and do it all. Um, we have 
some hardy bananas outside that are planted, the musabazjus, and we've got a couple of sycamensis. Um, last winter they didn't get wrapped. I kept watching and no, but I, there was a point where I thought, mm, you know, it's a bit iffy. And I think the hardest thing to replace would be our um, tree ferns. So I did actually wrap the tree ferns. We've got quite a few and it takes time. So I did wrap them and I do wrap. I don't just shove a bit of straw in the top because I think, oh, if, if we get a really bad winter, even a bit of straw won't cut the mustard. Even my wrapping might not, but I do everything possible. Um, so they did get wrapped, but the, the basjus, the bananas never did. They were fine. So that's how it is. It's a process of gradually bringing stuff in and packing it all away. The canners all get lifted as well. Um, they'll go in pots or trays, the ones that come out the ground, get cut back, and they're shoved under tables in the conservatory um, quite, quite a few areas in there have tables so that uh, smaller plants can be raised up near the light and underneath go all the canners and things that don't need the light for winter and the tallest plants go over the other side. We cannot see out of our lounge window at all. The bananas will cut them back to one roller when they go in but by the time they come out in spring um, they've grown a whole new set of leaves. So. <laughs> They probably flop pretty soon after coming out into the fresh air, but they soon grow a new lot, you know. That's what happens every year. I grow, in spring I grow about 180, I think I did this year, if not more, um, set seeds for ricinus of various varieties. So, you know, this year it's looking as though we've got um, some seed pods forming on those, so that'll be great, less to buy next year. And uh, yeah, so it goes on. It's uh, a few weeks bringing it out and then it'll be a few weeks getting it all in, tucked away for winter. And uh, it's early, early dark, so not being able to see out your lounge window isn't a problem. <laughs> it's just what we do. We're absolutely bonkers. People tell us and I said, oh no. <laughs> Simply fantastic. One of the best gardens best exotic back gardens I think I've ever seen and like I said earlier we'll do a specific separate video where we do a full tour of the secret garden of Laos coming up on my YouTube channel in a few weeks time and here in front of me is a plant I'm quite excited about it's a plant which many people thought would be impossible to produce and that is Trachycarpus fortianus which is a cross between Trachycarpus fortunii and Trachycarpus martianus. So it shall have the elegant form, the almost tropical form of martianus with the hardiness of Fortunii. Now, admittedly, at the moment, to most people, this looks like Trachycarpus Fortunii and no different from that species. But in time, I'm hoping this plant does start showing some features of the martianus. And I do have the martianus hidden behind the jungle behind me, which we'll be having a closer look at in a, another video coming up, which will be my annual look at all the different Trachycarpus family that I have growing in my garden, mainly along the fence line, but at this time of year it's hidden behind all the, all the jungle foliage here. But that dies down soon and it'll be dug up over the next few weeks like the onset bananas, and that will reveal all the Trachycarpus species to have every single one planted out. And this, Fortianus will be added to my collection and planted out and like I said in a few years time we should see this develop into a beautiful palm tree. Down here is what I call my early alarm system in terms of knowing when it's getting cool and it's time to bring in plants. These are the most tender plants that I grow every year. These are Coleus or Solenstonum and as you can see although it's been mild recently like I said earlier we've had a few nights down to five degrees so nowhere near frost levels or zero degrees but you can see these plants have really suffered. They are defoliating, we've got brown leaves, they're falling apart, and this shows that we've had those cool nights that the very tender plants like houseplants and coleus really don't like, and it's time to start thinking about bringing in those plants and disassembling a lot of the other half-hardy plants and bringing those in as well. 
If you want to see more incredible exotic gardens based here in the UK, check out this video. Thank you for watching. Join me next time. We'll be doing more in the garden.